Welcome everybody in, in our <coughs> seminar. So today uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, I mean, for us to, to have Felix Huber from uh, ICFO. Uh, so let me gi give you some background about Felix. So, okay, I, I didn't prepare, I, I, it's from my memory. So I think Philip did his master's in ETH Zurich. Although you get, you are giving this information to me quite recently, so I think I remember, so, <laughs> uh, like a week ago or so. So uh, yeah, uh, ETH Zurich, and then he went on to do his PhD with uh, Otfried Güne in, in Siegen, in Germany. Uh, afterwards, uh, he spent some time with David Gross in Cologne. Uh, and finally, he, I mean, finally, like he moved to like for a longer post postdoc position in, uh, to ICFO with uh, Tony Asin. Although, like we unfortunately didn't interact in, in Barcelona, like I left before Felix uh, came. So uh, yeah, Felix specializes in uh, quantum information, mathematical physics of quantum information, quantum error correction. Uh, and okay, many other mathematical things. So, okay, let me use this uh, chance. Okay, uh, okay, some people know it, but uh, Felix uh, actually uh, got accepted to be a group leader uh, in, in Gdansk in our consortium. This is official as of today. So let me uh, congratulate nice. you. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Yes, so, so he will be leading this. this uh, quantum error correction group. Uh, so we have a privilege so far, to have a yeah. presentation by a like future group leader of our, let's say, uh, yeah, friendly group. Uh, and yeah, today uh, Felix will be talk uh, telling us something about positive maps, <coughs> trace polynomials, and like relations to symmetric groups. So there will be a bit of quantum information as well as representation theory, which I think many of us like those connections. So please, Felix, the, the floor is yours. Okay, I think you can all hear me. Thanks a lot for, uh, for inviting me to this uh, online seminar. As you heard from uh, Michal, it's about positive maps and trace polynomials from a symmetric group. And uh, okay, let me turn off the fan anyway, because I hear it very loud when I speak. Yes. Okay. Let's talk about, so about this earlier, okay. So, uh, what is this talk about? Um, I want to show you how to construct trace polynomials. These are sort of uh, matrix polynomials that are positive on the positive cone. And uh, when I explain all what I mean with this. So, and before that, I want to tell you why it could be interesting or it could be interesting to you. Um, it relates to first positive map. So we all know positive map, you put in say a density matrix, an object from the positive cone, and it gives you again an object from the positive cone. Um, of course, this is uh, related to entanglement, point three, that every positive map corresponds to entanglement weakness and vice versa, with which we can detect entanglement. And uh, point two, there's something with scalar variables, which are, um, well, or these are positive polynomials, so polynomials that are positive for all variables we plug in. Here we say, we have, say, this polynomial x squared minus 2xy plus y squared, and you know trivially, well, this is, of course, positive for all x and y on R, because you can, you can uh, factorize it. Uh, it's a square of something. It's a square of x minus y squared. And then you know this is obviously positive. And uh, finally, it relates to something which is uh, known um, as matrix. Sorry, Felix. I, I think uh, the bottom part of your screen is cut from us. So we see only half of the uh, entanglement world. Yeah. Huh. Okay, that's not good. But, Let's see. Uh, but do you have any me... equations below? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, so, there's a fourth missing. Let me quickly but stop. But we, we are also seeing the, the, the part about the file and stuff like this. So maybe yeah, it's not. Full maybe thing. you should. Maybe you need to enter presentation mode or something like this. Um, let me just try it again. Oh, now. Yes. Uh, looks better. <laughs> oh, Good? yes. Oh. Okay. So we actually okay. saw only half. Okay. Now it, now it makes sense. So finally, it's related to, uh, to a matrix invariants and equivariant maps. So these are matrix invariants. These are expressions that are invariant. And you uh, conjugate all variables, matrices with unitaries. And equivariants are similar. 
It doesn't matter where you change the basis before on the input side or on the output side, you get the same. Okay, but I'll explain this a bit. So let's uh, do um, a gentle start. What we want to do consider the set of positive semi definite matrices, which we call the positive cone, and uh, we want to construct some positive semi definite expressions on, say, two matrix variables A and B of the same size, which are positive semi definite. So let's try. Um, to see the most commonly chosen approach, which many, well, at least what I once tried, is just take A times B plus B times A. Because one could think, ah, oh, this should be positive semi-definite as well, if A and B are. But that's not true. Yes? So this is a bad example. Let's choose another one, A squared plus B squared minus AB minus BA. So this is sort of the same example as before with scalar variables. And you see this factorizes. This factorizes to A minus B squared. And you know this is positive, regardless uh, what operator you have. If you have an Hermitian operator and you square it, you get something positive semi-definite. But of course, it's sort of boring because this is, again, um, what is known as a sum of square. This is just single square. But in general, these expressions, which you can write in this form, they're, they're trivially positive. Um, let's look at the last one, two times trace of A, trace of B, times the identity matrix, minus AB, minus BA. You can sort of see that this most likely will be positive semi-definite if you look at the eigenvalues, because um, A times B minus B times A is our mission matrix, and the biggest eigenvalue of that is two, or two times the trace of, of the product. So you see this positive semi-definite expression. This is good in principle, except that it's sort of trivial, but it's not a polynomial. Uh, sorry, I uh, okay, it's very maybe simple, but like. Uh, can you elaborate again? Why is it positive? I mean, I maybe know some proofs. Why is it positive? But just in this intuitive proof that you gave, can you repeat again? So let's say we take uh, we take a and b, and then we scale it to be density matrices. Let's replace a and b by rho and sigma. Yeah. Right. This is the same as dividing the whole equation by trace of a, trace of b. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What you get then? You get two times identity matrix minus rho times sigma minus sigma times rho. Uh, right, okay, I see. Mm -hmm. But rho times sigma, of course, mm -hmm. yeah. has eigenvalues smaller than one. Yeah. Because you take the product of two. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and the two just compensates for the fact that if on the right hand there's AB minus BA, that there's also sure, sure. a factor of that. And that expression is remission. Yeah, so that's uh, positive semi definite, but in a sort of uh, trivial way, in a sense. So, you can all, I mean, these expressions you can sort of see by playing around with the eigenvalues, but at some point it gets difficult if you add more variables. So that's what we want to do. We want to uh, find a systematic approach. So what do we consider? We consider the set of matrix trace polynomials. What are these? Well, these are expressions which we can write as a linear combinations and the products of matrix monomials, say x alpha one to x alpha r, and traces of such expressions. And to really make sense of it, because sometimes we have terms which have only traces, we can s we multiply this by that entity, or sometimes from now on we just leave it out, but we'll see it in a second. Um, and also, what you also want is that these expressions are multilinear, so the degree one in each variable. Okay, and we call these expressions multilinear trace polynomials because they look like polynomials, but they have traces in it. Okay, let's give an example. Uh, x, y, z plus trace of y, x, z minus trace x, z, trace y identity that's multilinear. Yeah, so every variable appears once in each monomial and um, it's a trace polynomial. It's only monomials and traces of monomials in there. Yeah. The expression below x, y, z plus x, z to the power of three plus y uh, times y and so on and so on is a trace polynomial and it happens also to be a polynomial, but it's not multilinear. So we don't we don't want it. So okay, we just want those above. They have to be multilinear, and they have to be um, uh, yeah. They can contain traces, but don't want to. Is that uh, good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just to, to sort of clear. So the talk will be about these trace polynomials. In my uh, older or first version of the preprint, I called them matrix contractions because it's sort of like you have tensors and you can track them somehow with, with wiring diagrams, but I realized that the matrix contraction has a very specific meaning in matrix theory, so the correct term for these sort of expressions are trace polynomials. 
that's this already. Okay, so the question we ask is, which multilinear trace polynomials are positive on the positive cone? And with positive on the positive cone, I mean, they have to evaluate the positive semi-definite expressions where, when all the variables are themselves positive semi-definite. Okay? So we have the whole set of trace polynomials that are positive, and then the subset contains polynomials. The subset of those polynomials are sum of squares, S of S. And we have the subset of multilinear um, expressions. And uh, that's what we look here at. So I'll give you the answer already now, and later I want to show you the tricks, how to use this, because I think the tricks are more interesting than just the, than just the result. So the answer is the set of such multilinear trace polynomials, which is positive and positive cone, that set is convex. And the boundary of that convex set bijects with the set of optimal entanglement thicknesses for multiple type Werner states. Yeah. Um, Werner states, you know, those are these are those states which are invariant under uh, conjugate twirling. So you can multiply u tensor n on both sides of uh, n partite state rho, and it stays invariant under this under this uh, operation. And as a funny consequence, we have that if you have four matrix variables or more, this set of such trace polynomials has an infinite number of extreme points. When you look at the symmetric trace polynomial. It's not super important, but it's kind of funny that you have, um, because you could think, oh, maybe this set is simply a poly polyeder, uh, a polygon, and a polyeder, and uh, so this doesn't have, this doesn't happen. So this set really is, so, is continuous. So can you, can one view those things as like, uh, just like, uh, like relate those things to like multilinear, let's say entanglement. Uh, okay, entanglement weaknesses, like but but multilinear ones that are like invariant under this uh, U trend, like uh, diagonal action of U. What do you mean by multilinear weaknesses? Multi multi copy or? Yeah. Oh wait. Um. No. Okay. I I got a, ahead of myself. Uh, okay. It's. Uh, no, okay, please, please go on. Like, I, I think I got confused. <laughs> okay, so. I'll, uh, I'll explain a bit, okay? First, so this is just the answer to this question that you know already, where it aims at. Mm -hmm. These uh, positive multilinear maps, or these positive multilinear trace polynomials, they bijack with essentially Werner state witnesses. And uh, now I show you how to sort of, how to derive this, or the basic trick, because it's very not, it's not really complicated after all. So the, the proof idea rests on two things. One is sort of the tricks with swaps, so you know the swap operator, here I call it one, two. It's permutation, it exchanges two tensor factors, first and the second, here V and W, and when you apply it from one side, it just changes. Changes the order for all uh, V and W. And uh, so this is uh, sort of curious, but you can, you, can recalc you can calculate it on paper quite quickly. There's a fact that you take two matrices A and B of the same size, uh, you tensor them together, you multiply the swap in front, and then you take the trace. This simply gives the trace of the product. Yeah, this, this is sort of, why does this happen? It's because um, the, under the trace, in, in, in tensor notation, you would write like, you write two blocks, A tensor B, and then you trace it. But what happens if you exchange the input on both sides is that this guy wants to go here, but actually it goes to the next block. And the same happens on the other side. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but it's just, it's very easy to calculate. And the second thing is, that's maybe a bit less known, that if you take a partial trace, so you can trace only over the first system where A lives, and you do ex trace the same expression, swap A tensor B, you get simply A times B. Okay, this is also a very simple calculation. And uh, so we want to generalize this, to use this later for these, for these maps. So how do we do this? We look at more general permutations that exchange k tensor factors. So we have a pi permutation acting on k vectors, the product of k vectors, and uh, it acts by, uh, by pushing them around. There's this pi to the minus one. Each time this happens because the operation actually takes, I mean, uh, it, it looks a bit funny, but when you when you think about it, it really takes 
pi minus one tells you where something comes from. And, uh, um, yeah, so you want to know what, what comes to position one, that's exactly pi minus one. You just want it to be a representation, right, of the permutation group, yes. that's why. Well, it's sort of active permutation of passive. It could also be pi of one, but this is sort of the active way. Sure, sure. But I mean, like, you around. can have, like, I mean, if you compose group elements, that corresponds to composition <laughs> of the corresponding operators. And, yes. like, this, this rule gives you this. Yes. Yeah. Um, so let's make an example. We have this permutation one for three, two, and it acts on these four tensor factors. You see uh, V1, person position one goes to position four on the right hand side. Um, position four goes to position three. And the two stays at the same place. Okay, very simple. So um, using the same trick as before, you sort of have to believe me or just recalculate it. It's really not, not hard, it's just a bit of an index battle. But suppose we have the permutation that but the inverse of the permutation one, two, three, four, five, well, one to k, we take the inverse. Here we write it as k dot 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 one. And we let it act on these k tensor factors, x1 tensor and so on, to tensor xk. And we trace over everything except the last system k. So now we get something similar as before. We simply get the product of these matrices. We get x1, the matrix, matrix product from x1 to xk. So if you go back, this is really the quite the same as before. Here we have just two factors, one, two, A tends to B, and we get the product AB. Here we get the product of all these matrices. And that's sort of the way to translate these products into uh, permutations and back forward, okay? If you have permutations that don't act on everything, here I took a full cycle, but the permutation is decomposed in different cycles, you simply get traces for those things which are completely under the trace and the matrix product for the last thing. So all these trace polynomial expressions, you can simply rewrite them in form of these partial traces over permutations. Yeah. Um, so the next trick is, this is sort of the Joy Yamukovsky isomorphism, but for people like me who learned this very late, you can think, see it as a trick with partial trace. So um, if you have a positive operator acting on two partite system, positive semi-definite, and you let it act on x tensor identity and trace only one system out, you get a positive semi-definite expression when x is positive semi-definite. Yeah? That's the backward direction from, from Joy Yamukovsky without the transpose. So why is this true? Um, is this true? Is this uh, obvious to everybody or? So uh, it would be great if you could elaborate a bit. So, one way to see it without making use of uh, very complicated machinery or Joachim Mukovsky directly is that you use the self-duality of the positive code. What does that mean? A matrix is positive semi-definite if and only if the, the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product trace of A times B is non-negative for all positive semi-definite operators B. You can sort of see this that you take A and you take phi phi, you wedge it in between a cat and the bra of the same vector, and uh, that's the characterization of a positive semi matrix. It has only non-negative eigenvalues, no non-negative expectation values on, on pure states. Yeah? And you can sort of wrap it around, and then you have a set of phi phi on both sides, you just write P. Okay? And we check this now. So you take the expression trace of one P x tensor identity times B, uh, multiply it with some other operator B, and take the trace, like before. And now you see that um, to go to the equation on the right side, there's a trick which I used just below, which I explain in a second. But what happens is that you get the trace of P times X tends to B. And because X is positive semi-definite and B, and also P, you can simply get the trace in the product of two positive semi-definite operators, and that's something. What did we use just right now? Um, we used the coordinate free definition of the partial trace. So when you have an operator that, that is, when you have a trace in a product of which one operator is, it has not support everywhere, so here identity tensor n, and you take the inner product with some other operator, here m, then it's the same as if you, if you trace out a part where the identity acts on, on this other operator m. Yeah? So that's the 
That's the sort of the coordinate free definition of the partial trace. And you can, you can plug this in on top, and then you see that um, this expression on the left hand side really goes over into this trace of p times x tends to b. Is that clear? Uh, so, just yeah, yeah, it's super clear. I was just confused by this. Uh, I think we discussed this once uh, during the group dinner, like those kind of uh, things. In, uh, yeah, I think you explained me that actually. Like no, <laughs> More no I'm just laughing, but uh, like the, the, this whenever is like. Uh, the point is like, okay, of, of course, if X is positive semi-definite, then the thing in the left is positive, but uh, it's not even only, I mean, so you, like you can have like maybe for some negative, uh, for not positive definite X, like the left-hand side can be still maybe positive, right? Maybe. Um, so for not positive P? No, for not the... positive X, for some, um some. yeah for some yeah yeah i mean okay. what i wanted what we wanted to check is simply um whether this expression on top trace one of p x tends identity that's positive and to check it we multiply it with b and then we see that this is not negative yeah mm -hmm. okay or did you did you mean you said no, that I, when I, I x is not that that sometimes sometimes let's say the action of this map Right, like can give something positive, some definite, even if the input, if the x is not positive, because well, it's whenever yes. such as so. maybe if and only if this is all I want. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, the so top like, line is not if only if. That's only whenever. Okay, this is maybe my understanding. Like I misunderstood English. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And yes, good, sorry, for, just uh, go on, sorry. Whenever I think is if, right? Probably you're right. Yeah, like okay. al always if or something like this, right? So, but like, like every time when X is positive semi-definite, this stuff is holding. So yes. I would also get it uh, like this. Uh, sorry, sorry, Felix. Okay, okay, no, so, maybe, yeah. So P is not completely positive, right? It just talks about positivity, not completely positive. There's nothing on that. No, not yet. Okay, good. I uh, don't hear you anymore, but okay. Um, okay, I continue. So to get multilinear maps, we sort of do the same. We just adopt, adapt this uh, expression from before. So what do we do? We take, uh, again, a positive operator and a list of positive matrices, x1 to xk, Tensor them together, except the last spot like before. Take the partial trace over everything except the last spot, and we see this is positive operator, a positive semi-definite operator, okay? So here is the pictorial representation of this, which is much, much easier in some sense to read. So you see you have this positive P, and then you, 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 you connect it X1 to XR, well, R, K minus one, I'm sorry. Um, this, this gets traced in, and the last line that's identity, this one is open. Okay, the proof is exactly the same as before. And what do we get? Well, we get the multilinear map from here k minus one copies, uh, matrices, to a uh, single matrix. Yeah. So now we just put this together. We use this generalized swap trick that we can translate permutations into matrix products, and we use this sort of adapted joy Markovsky isomorphism. Uh, so we choose this. P operator simply as a linear combination of permutations, APP. And then we say, well, we take again this, this expression, partial trace over P times all these, uh, all these matrix variables, and we see that this is a positive expression. So this is a multilinear trace polynomial that's positive on the positive form. Is that sort of clear? Yeah. Okay, let's take an example. We take uh, a projector onto some invariant subspace. Why do we do this? Well, this is sort of very simple. Um, here we get positivity for free. Yeah? If you know that it's a projector, then we know all oh, this operator also has to be positive. Same okay, so we take the projector, the nothing permutation, minus one, two, minus two, three, minus one, three, plus the three, uh, the cycles of length three, that's positive semi-definite, and we plug it in on top. So we have only two two matrix variables, x, tensor y, tensor identity. 
multiplied by p, take the partial trace over the first two systems, and we get this expression below. So we see here, what do we have? The first term gives us a trace x, trace y, because there's no permutations in, in, in the first, uh, no permutation, times identity, I didn't write identity here, minus trace of x, y, times identity, because this permutation one, two connects these two. Uh, we have trace of x times y, because the two, three connects the, the second variable y with the third variable identity, yeah? and so on. So the, the, the cycles of length three gives us products, at yx plus xy. And so we see that this expression here, this is positive semi-definite whenever xy is positive semi-definite. If someone could turn off on his uh, microphone, that would be nice because I don't hear. <laughs> It's like speaking to an empty... Yeah, a lot of people are nodding, I guess. Um, but yeah. okay. okay, I don't see them. If anybody <laughs> breathes sometime, that's nice. We are just nodding, yes. So, yes, we agree. Sorry, Everything sorry. It's nice. Okay. So, uh, does the signature... Uh, hi. Yes. Uh, yeah, so does the... In the example, like, when you look at the expression, you see that the signature of the... The signature of the 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 permutation when that is a I mean does the signature of the permutation play some sort of co some significant role in deciding when it is positive and when it is not necessarily positive? Um, is there any statement on that at all, or is that just a coincidence in this case? So this because is one two three what again. I... Like if you take the three cycle one two three again, that is sorry. So. Okay. So this, this is just an example where um, we take an irreducible representation of the symmetry proof. So you can construct this by taking central sure. uh, idempotents in the group ring. And if you take the, if you take the completely anti-symmetric subspace, so you take the young tableau with three rows, yeah, right. you get exactly this expression. Okay? If you write ah, down the Young symmetrizer, right. that's not enough. Ah, young okay, yeah, in the Young equation. symmetrizer you have, ah, right, right, right. So they, in the Young symmetrizer you have that signature coming in for one of the subgroups and not for the other subgroup. Okay, fine, fine, fine. okay, cool. Okay, for the completely unsymmetric right. Young symmetrizer, it happens to your mission, but usually if you write down a Young symmetrizer, like the way people explain it in the book how to do it, your the expression won't be your mission in general. Yeah, only for the completely positive for the row tableau, for the column tableau, you will have a, you will have a Hermitian expression as well. This is important here, because in the group so, ring, these irreducible projectors will be sort of left either either left ideals or right ideals, but not not both. Right. Uh, yeah. Can I can I ask? Uh, okay. So, so basically, this the signature. So basically, I just wanted to know if that like a signature plays a significant. So the signature comes from the. Was, uh, yeah, okay, fine. Okay. Yeah. The signature comes from the fact that I just take a young tableau, construct a projector onto this irrep or the central projector yeah, yeah, yeah. is irrep, and this is the simplest way to get. Well, there are simpler ways to get positive expressions, but this is sort of nice. Okay. So can I just ask, like, uh, for me, it would be natural to take projectors onto irreps of the unitary group as opposed to. I mean, okay, it's like sort of uh, there. Of course, you have show value duality. So, uh, like, uh, how to phrase, uh, phrase I mean, you could have just uh, take projectors on to, yeah, uh, irreducible representations of the unitary group in this uh, multi, like, uh, mo uh, multi-particle space, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, I mean, that would be the, the same kind of stuff. Like, wh wh why do... Uh, Oh, I don't know how to evaluate them. I mean, here... No, it's like they're just the same. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, what I constructed is, is uh, U, UL tensor SL, like the, the, sh the sure functor tensor, the, the other. Yes, sure. No, the sure. central idempotents. They, they both commute with the unitaries and with the... Ah, okay. Sure, sure. Okay, but you could have go to the smaller ones, right? Yeah, yeah. You could have... Uh... So the, the default way or simpler way, um, I'm not sure if... Uh, maybe I wrote it in a line somewhere in the paper. I actually uploaded a new version, which is much, hopefully, much clearer. Uh, you can also just take any element in a group ring and take uh, square it, so... Mm -hmm. or take the Hermitian square. So you take an element A in the group ring and we write A star A and this will be Hermitian operator by default. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, yeah. I take this construction here because it's sort of nice. You can use a bit of representation theory and you sure, play with young sure. tableaus and yes, gives yes. you the decomposition no, of the identity. Okay, the, just in principle, like if you would like to do some optimization over those objects, so let's say uh, they, okay, okay, this is maybe for some, I mean, it's possible. Like there would be effectively just, I, how, uh, okay, at least some variant of this object would you can have like a, uh, there would be like isomorphic to a bunch of like direct copies of positive semi definite matrices, I guess, because you have, okay, but, and, and then it's maybe uh, feasible to do numerical optimization over it because it will like reduce <laughs> to SDP in some case. Um, so these maps, it depends what you want to use them for. I'll show in a second that these maps are they're not completely positive but they're tensor stable mm -hmm. so in some sense they're not if you want matrix inequalities they're not optimal they're just as optimal well, okay that's sort of conjecture but they are as just about as good enough to be tensor stable mm -hmm. okay um so the other thing if you want to optimize something it can be a bit compl more complicated okay maybe i just continue and then you see the other part this is simply an example where you take uh, by default, positive operator, and you evaluate it, and you mm -hmm. see some, you get some things yeah. sort of interesting. Okay, so now we make it stronger with entanglement witnesses, as I promised you. So we take we replace p by an entanglement witness w, and uh, so recall if an entanglement witness uh, gives the positive expectation value in all product states or all separable states, but it detects at least some entangled state and gives a negative expectation value on some entangled one. So now we choose again some witness but or some operator as a linear combination of permutations, but now it doesn't have to be positive. It just has to fulfill these two these conditions. So this is also known as the Werner state witness because um, it shares the invariance of the Werner states. So let's make an example. We take um, this uh, object in the group ring, uh, the identity minus one, two, minus one, three, minus two, three, uh, plus one, two, three, Oops, there's something wrong. There shouldn't be the identity and identity term. That's uh, yeah. What happened there? Oh no, sorry, sorry. Yeah, this is again the same uh, expression as before. Yeah, and then it was shown by Eckelin and Werner in a seminal paper that the overlap between separable states and this uh, omega is one over six at most. So now we can construct a projector-based witness. So we take the witness one over six identity minus this omega. Yeah. Then you see this witness has exactly this property. It's positive. It's, a, it's, it's always uh, non-negative on separable states, but it detects some entangled states. Okay. So you take this and you evaluate it. Um, you can again add it on the same spot where before there was the p, and you get this map below. And now you say, actually, is there a proof? Um, no. Okay. Uh, why does this also work? Why does the operator doesn't have to be positive? It's simply because at the end of the day, the, the variables that you plug in, they will have always a tensor product form, right? You have like x1, tensor x2, up to x, k minus 1 as variables. And they're individually positive semi-definite. So what we sort of plug in into these expressions are always product states or separable states. And that's why it's enough to take a witness. Yeah. Um, and then we get uh, we get again these sort of funny um, matrix inequalities. And here maybe it's less trivial why this should be positive as an expression, right? This uh, trace x y plus trace of x times y plus trace of y x minus their product. And uh, well, it's sort of not as non-trivial enough that uh, Eklin Werner has shown it in the paper that overlap is one over six or this is equivalent to this statement yeah okay um let's continue a bit this expression that i just showed before is optimal in the sense that it can reach eigenvalue zero and uh, it's actually the boundary of the set of these positive trace polynomials and uh, the same uh, method gives a characterization of all optimal all of these type of optimal positive multilinear trace polynomials. These are in a one to one correspondence with optimal Werner state witnesses. So every Werner state witness that we, that we have, we can immediately translate into an interesting trace polynomial inequality for the positive cause. 
And uh, here with this, this connection again, we can find it with the result of Maas and Kummerer that the set of optimal positive trace polynomials has an infinite number of extreme points when we have four or more matrix variables. Okay, that's sort of cute and tells us this set is very hard to describe. And you should expect it because you, couldn't, you could expect that the set of all these matrix inequalities, which you can write down in this form, is sort of complicated to describe, yes? Um, so let me talk but, a bit. Sorry, can I, can I ask? Uh, so, but is it known if one can describe the set in terms of like maybe semi-definite program? Because then it's, yeah. Um, let's go to the semi-definite program. Um, uh, I don't, I'm not sure. Well, for finite dimensions, maybe. I don't know. No, no. Mm. I mean, you have to evaluate the weakness for a state. I don't think this is that easy, even if it's a Werner state. And there's another thing that, in general, dimension-free variables, it's a very hard problem because it connects with the, uh, with the leap conjecture for immanence. Okay, I won't talk about this, but it connects with very hard combinatorial conjectures for, mm -hmm. uh, for sort of generalized determinants. Uh, so I think, in general, it will be a very hard question. For finite dimensions, I'm not sure if one can do something. I mean, actually, I don't think so because you will, one has to optimize over tensor product states, which is hard. I see. I see. Mm -hmm, this is a, uh, okay. One can thanks. do, I don't know, symmetric extension or so, but uh, that's another talk, maybe. Uh, right. Okay. You can maybe like approximate this set, like as you do. With, uh, sure. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. Uh, a bit more, fun. how much time do I still have? Uh, a bit more fun with tensor. Um, we can talk, ask whether these maps are tensor stable. What does this mean? Well, if you have lambda, which is a positive map, how about we let act lambda on every, on every subsystem, lambda tensor n. If this is still positive, then we call this map tensor stable. So we take an example, which is very simple, for, which comes from the reduction map, or, or the reduction criterion for entanglement detection. We take this positive operator, nothing, permutation, minus one, two. And we do the map from before. We take partial trace over this P times rho tensor density. So here we take density matrix rho because we want to connect it a little bit with entanglement theory, after all, or with the quantum info. So we get this map trace of rho identity minus rho. And uh, I think, I sh okay, I'm not sure if I've shown this map at the beginning on one of the slides, but this is a positive map, which is not completely positive. It's also known as the reduction criterion. Um, it's not great, but it's sort of the most trivial map that you can, or one of the most trivial maps that you can write down uh, next to the partial transpose map. So this is tensor stable. You can take this, this P on each subsystem, and then you just write a big P in terms of this tensor product of these small ones. And if you evaluate it, you get this really funny uh, expression that you have for every multipartite state rho, with n subsystems, uh, you can take this alternating uh, sum of reductions tensor with the identity on the component. And you see this will give you positive semi-definite operator. Okay, this was known as has different versions and a little generalization as well as universal state inversion or shadow operator inequality and was used in uh, uh, to, to get uh, monogamy of entanglement relations and bound of quantum codes and um, some compatibility relations between marginals for the quantum marginal problem. Um, and it's sort of non-trivial. So for two systems, the expression would be the identity matrix minus rho A, tensor identity on B, minus rho B, plus rho AB, that would be positive semi-definite operator. That's very, uh, well, it would be hard to prove otherwise, on general, if one wouldn't have this trick. Uh, here, let's make a more complicated example, which was not known, so we take another expression. Sorry, Felix. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. I, I actually got what, uh, what it was all about, but I'm not sure, I mean, just for didactic reasons. So, uh, basically, this is this projector that you've got there is a, uh, it's what, is it's like a projection onto like anti-symmetric subspace, right? Yeah, exactly. Two guys, and then you just, so 
proliferated, right? So then you have like a tensor yeah. product of projectors onto the symmetric subspaces, like, uh, you know, uh, right. And then it's, it's still like a positive semi-definite operator, right? Exactly. And then yeah, you, can, you can see that, yeah. I mean, what, what uh, Felix is claiming, I mean, would be pro positive, of course, yeah. Just a comment, because yeah. maybe it was... No, it's good, it's good. Um, yeah, so we, the, the sort of concept here is very simple. You take, as Michal said, you take a positive operator, you take tensor products with itself or with other positive semi-definite operators that you can write in terms of linear combinations of permutations, and that gives you, again, uh, obviously positive operator. And if you work out these contractions or these where these uh, permutations act on, you get kind of funny maps that uh, it would be hard to sort of see that they that they are true or that they're positive otherwise. So here I give another one, which is maybe a bit more complicated, and we see it's not so trivial to see that this should be positive semi-definite. Uh, you take this projector onto the young tableau with uh, three boxes, two in the first row and one in the second. You get this uh, projector onto the onto the invariant subspace. A positive semi definite, and below I wrote you sort of the when you let this act on x tensor y tensor identity, you see below this these sort of contractions over the tensors. Okay, the first term just ten traces over x and y, the second um, is the multiplication of x with y, and the last one is sort of uh, inverted multiplication. You sort of first go to y, then to x, and then identity. And if you take the tensor products of those and you, you work it out, you get actually this really strange expression below that for all multiple height states rule and sigma, um, this expression where you have these partial transposes on A, so you take rho on the reduction S and mu on the reduction S, you take the partial transposes on A, which are subsystems of S, multiply it and take the partial transpose again, uh, and then this, this alternating sum is positive semi -definite. Yeah, so you get very curious and sort of nice, uh, nice expression. Okay, let's let's switch a little bit for the end because otherwise it's also how much time do I have? Hopefully not too boring. Um, what is cool is the sort of same method can, you can also use to get identities from matrices. And uh, here is one which is called the polarized scaling Hamilton theorem. Uh, Lev or Lou proved this in 1966 that when x and y are two by two matrices, then this expression below is zero. Yeah, and we've We've seen this expression before, but before I claim that this expression is positive semi-definite on all x, y matrices, yeah? But here it just happens that it doesn't matter what you plug in for x and y, as long as they're two by two, this gives you zero. And the, the, it's a consequence, or it follows from the Kelly hamilton theorem on um, that the matrix is the solution of its own characteristic polynomial. How can you see it in a sort of, different way. Um, you can see it by just taking the, anti, the, the projector onto the completely anti-symmetric subspace of three systems. So that's this expression I showed you before. And you can see because it completely anti-symmetrizes three objects, this is too anti-symmetric for C2, for the two by, for the specter space with only two entries. Yeah? Because you, it's enough to sort of look at only a basis in this vector space and you only have two linearly independent uh, basis elements in there, but you anti symmetrize three, so you can see that this gives you zero. Okay, and this is known, so um, as this, as this Cayley-Hamilton, or polarized Cayley-Hamilton theorem, and more generally, all multilinear trace polynomial identities, so all these multilinear trace polynomials that evaluate to zero for a given set, some given D times T, for, so for a set of D times T matrices, these are consequences of the KDM theorem. So what is nice? Sorry, can you elaborate on this? I didn't, uh, the last part I didn't get. Like, so is it like, uh, did you like rediscover this thing that was observed in that paper or it's some other way to prove the results from that paper? And in what sense, like, it seems that we have like some, uh, alge like algebraic geometry like going on here, like, here, like, so, so in, in what sense all multilinear trace polynomials, yeah, what do we mean by, uh, what do authors mean by this statement, yeah. So this identity above is simply matrix identity, 
And sure. I, yeah, did I rediscover it? I think so. I sort of looked it up and then I found it in the yep. Matrix, in the Mid Matrix book. Yeah. And uh, you see small examples for two by two and three by three, and it's sort of people know this for a long time that this this happens. Yeah. And uh, well, the proof is extremely simple if you write in this language. No, 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 no uh, Felix, Felix. Uh, but the, the thing below. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Sorry. I go to the thing below. Um. So first of all, what is, a, what is a polynomial identity? People were studying polynomial expressions of matrices that give you the zero matrix in the direct. Mm -hmm. And this is related to trace polynomial identities. If I say the polynomials, you look at trace polynomials that give you zero uh, on some d times t matrices, on all d times t matrices for some number uh, dimension d. And Razmilov and Pochesi, in, in what, 70s, they showed that all these identities that exist, that are multilinear, these are consequences, sort of by a process called polarization or multilinearization of the Cayley Hampton theorem. So you take the Cayley Hampton theorem that says the matrix is the solution, or a matrix A is the solution of its own uh, characteristic polynomial. You expand the characteristic polynomials in terms of traces of sure, sure. powers of A. You, Replace A by the uh, sum of matrices, and then you can uh, you can sort of splice out some terms, and then you see that you can get this multilinearized form. Okay, it feels a bit like magic at the beginning, but it's really. But it's like both ways. So first, of course, like this. Uh, fine. Okay. So so like from every multilinear like uh, trace polynomial identity, you can trace it back to like. Doing some process on the like uh, to to Kelly Hamilton, uh, I mean to, to the characteristic polynomial basically. Exactly. Okay. Another way to say this is because the Kelly Hamilton theorem simply is the fact that if you take the completely altismetric subspace over d plus one elements and you yeah. let it act on a d-dimensional, no, it's systems, zero. Yeah, it's zero, and that's yeah. the. I mean, it's stated a little uh, bit different or. Um, some people would say all, all multilinear trace polynomials are um, correspond to Young tableau with more than d column, d rows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the other yeah, way right. to say it. So it has to be symmetric in, sorry, it's, okay, yeah, something, okay, fine, Kelly. No, no, you just take any element in the, in the um, uh, group algebra of the ideal corresponding so, to Young tableau with more so than d rows. So can I say it, for instance, so like what I, what's, what struck me first is like, you know, the expression that you have on top, I mean, it, you can consider it to, that it has to be symmetric between X and the identity and at the same time, it has to be anti-symmetric you know, between all X, Y, Z. Sorry, sorry, X, Y, and like the third guy. Okay, so now the third guy over here you're taking is identity. So mm -hmm. that's why it has to be symmetric as well as anti-symmetric and hence zero. That is what struck me, but I don't know if this can be generalized, but you sort of- Yeah, yeah that's exactly what happens. You, you take, if you take the, if you take the projector onto completely anti-symmetric subspace and let it act on something, you get a completely anti-symmetric expression. So what you say is true. And it's sort of the smallest identity that, that you can write for two by two, well, sort of, it is the smallest identity that you can write for two by two matrices. Because all these identities are consequences of young tableau that have more than D rows, so more than two here, so the young tableau, the smallest young tableau with three rows has exactly three boxes. And you take any young symmetrizer in that, in that uh, ideal, ideal of uh, well, more than three anti-symmetrizing boxes and you get, uh, you get automatically this, this anti-symmetrizer on three systems. Okay, this may be a bit cryptic for people who don't know so much about representation theory, but the Co the idea is the one below that if you take an object that anti-symmetrizes more elements that you have available in your vector space, what you get out is zero. Yeah, that's the sort of bottom line. So we can play the same games in tensor product spaces, and I think that's that's fun as well. So we can look at tensor identities. Okay, we take matrix polynomials or matrix trace polynomials, PI to QI, sum it up. Uh, well, take the trans product and sum it up with some positive weights or not actually positive any any coefficients. And now we ask, well, can we construct expressions that, regardless what the two times two matrix we plug in, we get always the zero matrix, or we get always something proportional to the identity, or we get always something proportional to the swap from a uh, to a permutation pi or say a permutation that only permutes two. 
So, so we get an Alaska school likes this a lot for their time machines um, where they can sort of make a system go backwards in time. Okay, they call it a swap polynomial because you have an expression and then you get the swap, the swap operator out. But in general, you can construct this for any permutation. Yeah? Um, and here we have a characterization again. So all of these multilinear trace polynomial identities that live on tensor product spaces, they are also consequence of the Kelly Hamilton theorem. And before I indulge you too much with these um, uh, theoretical things, I'll just give you an example because that's more easier. Let's say we have x1 to x4. These are any two by two matrices you can give me. And then I take this expression, okay? I take x, I completely undesymmetrize this tensor product of x first position times x in second position tensor third and the fourth. Yeah? And I sum up over all these permutations in S4. So these are probably 12. Uh, yeah. 24 terms, huh? Okay, sorry. I yeah. lost something. That's <laughs> terrible. It should be, it should be. That's of course wrong. Okay. Um, okay, that's a bit bad. Um, there should be the sign of sigma mm -hmm. in the expression as well. Okay. So it would be x1 times x2 tensor x3 times x4 minus the next one x2 times x1 tensor x3 times x4 and so on so this the sign of the permutation is missing here i'm terribly sorry okay if you evaluate this you will see you will always get a zero matrix and you can ask well why is this true and it's true because again the um this is again sort of the same reason that you take sufficiently antisymmetrizing operate or, or sufficiently antisymmetrizing projectors or operators in, in the group algebra and let them act on tensor product spaces that are too small so so they always vanish okay so there are consequence again of the scaling ample theorem or in other terms of young tableau with enough rows okay and what is particularly nice about this expression is that you can say ah maybe I can easily write down a, a, such a tensor identity by just taking tensoring two identities together, right? That's trivial. If it's an identity in the first one and you tensor with the second one, you get, you get again zero. But here, what is nice is you, this is not the case here. You can show it cannot be factorized into, sep into separately vanishing expressions because um, this is a theorem by Amit Levitsky. It says that any polynomial identity, such identity on a single system that vanishes on all D times D matrices, it needs to have at least degree 2D. So if I have dimension two, and um, then 2D is of course, the degree of the polynomial has to be four on a single system. Okay? But here you see the degree of the polynomial is four on this tensor product space. So that's why, or that's how you can see, you cannot factorize it. It's not the trivial consequence of the other. It's really a separate identity. Yeah? Okay, there will be a sooner paper on this, tensor polynomial identities, and I think, uh, with this, I will finish. Time is also over. So uh, I've presented you a framework that one can use to map permutations to the matrix multiplication, or more general, to, to trace polynomials. And you can use this to characterize these trace polynomials that are positive in the positive column with entanglement theory, or particularly with Werner state weaknesses. And uh, you can also use this to explore tensor stable trace polynomials. So these lambda tensor n and identities on tensor product spaces. Okay, and with this, I thank you for your attention and uh, yes, thank you. open for uh, questions. Thank you. For a very nice talk. Uh, uh, yeah, so we have time for questions, comments to the speaker. So about the Cayley Hamilton theorem, I did not understand like, uh, so characteristic equation of which operator so i mean firstly like you know you have have uh, wait so can you go back to like the, the page uh, uh fun with tensors part two some this one you introduce the kelly hamilton thing uh, this no, one so before this one no yeah this one so yeah so so wait kelly kelly hamilton of like uh, that's not kidding. which operator? I, I think you mean this one, no? Uh, are you considering? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, Kelly Hamilton of which operator? Like, so I mean, 
the I've, I've I've done the method only once, like on small matrices. But so the way it, the way it works, you take you take the the characteristic polynomial of of some operator. Let's call it A. Okay, of some operator. Okay, some operator A, and then A so is a solution of its own characteristic polynomial. Sure, now, I understand that. Characteristic but... polynomial, you replace all these. Um, you convert it into powers into traces of powers of A. Okay, because usually the characteristic polynomial would be something like that of A minus trace, whatever. Yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. You can convert this all into powers of A. And these powers of A, now what happens, this multilinearization process replaces A by a sum of, say, alpha times A plus beta times B plus gamma of C times C, yeah, into some of these terms. And then you get a well, you evaluate it again, and because it's you have a lot of lot of terms, and then because it's um, good question, then you can sort of count a lot of terms again, which are which contains only C's and only B's, yeah, because of the, of Cayley Hamilton again. And if you do this in the correct way, at the end, what you end up with is with, is with multilinear expressions. And this procedure is called polarization. If you're very curious, I can I can uh, send you the article by Formanek, which explains this very nicely on the page. Um, but yeah, but this is, this process is called multilinearization or polarization. Sure. So some other questions? Okay. So I have one question. So those uh, polynomial identities. Mm -hmm. uh, how they are useful in quantum information? Um, so, good question. Um, I think most papers on this is by Miguel Vasquez. He uses this, I think, yes. the first place where he uses it, and I think Reinhard Berner saw this already a bit earlier, is that you can use them for rank detection. Rank detection? Because, yes, okay. because um, you have a reduction and you let it eat by this polynomial identity, it will give you zero when the rank is small enough, the Schmidt rank or whatever cut. And otherwise, if it's non-negative, you know the rank has to be bigger. Mm -hmm. Ah, so it, it can be like, like lower bound on the, like, sort of like a dimension witness maybe. Yes. You can sort of do it like this. Mm -hmm. um, ah. Exactly. So, um, and Miguel, it's quite funny. So he has this paper called uh, something like structure of matrix product states and, and um, something where he uses this to detect the rank in matrix product states, but also he has some kind of cut and glue operators. Those polynomials which evaluate your identity, you can sort of let them act on a sub part of this matrix product state. Mm -hmm. And because it gives you identity up to D times D matrices mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. rank D operators, you can sort of cut out the sub part of your matrix product state and mm -hmm. glue it back together. I see. This is kind of fun. I see, um, I see. And then, okay, I just, uh, what I didn't get exactly is where, I mean, so this is like a very cool sort of story and I understand, okay, to some extent, I understand that when you take uh, any expression that comes from a young symmetrizer that anti-symmetrizes more than, uh, like that has, the depth greater than the dimension d, it will mm -hmm. evaluate to zero. So then, yeah. I, so, but like, uh, just a question, like where is like, uh, so uh, where is, uh, let's say, how do you go uh, in your results behind, uh, uh, like, uh, so is that different characterization of this uh, identities or uh, different than Kaylee Hamilton or, uh, um. yeah. In a sense, uh, Kaylee Hamilton will tell you the same. Okay, I mean, if you okay. read these books by Rasmilov, Pochesi, or, or, or the new books, they will tell you um, there's, as I mentioned, another way would be every multilinear trace polynomial corresponds to a object in the ring of, in the ideal of um, elements that that correspond to Young Tableau with more than mm -hmm. zero. Mm -hmm. And right. it will be, I think, more or less equivalent to the Kaylee Hamilton theorem. Mm -hmm. I, see. Okay. I see. But there's, I mean, there's a lot of tricks one has to use, you know, these Newton polynomials for symmetric functions and so on. 
these polarization okay. procedures. So There's this, ways so to do this, it. This, but, so um, this is a bit simpler, this approach you're saying, or? Well, for me, it's very simple because sure, sure. Uh, this, this, the first line above here, it's simply, you take the projector with three of the young tableau with three rows, Sure, no, act on X, tensor Y, tensor identity, take the partial mm -hmm. trace of the first systems, and it's obviously zero because this projector sure. eats everything of small dimension. Mm -hmm. So you just take the partial trace of something that is zero already, mm -hmm. and you turn it into zero matrix, so to say. So, okay, one more technical question. Okay, typically, I, these days I care more about applications, <laughs> but like, uh, like those those identities for fixed dimension, they will form what they form a like a subspace, right? Uh, like if you add to, to such two identities, yeah. like they form, they form a polynomial a identity ring. Uh, right, but like it's if you term. have like a fixed yeah. order for fixed order, they form like it's like a subspace. So what is the basis of this? I mean, you can sort of think. No, that would be some subspace. Uh, I can tell you the ring is generated by the Young symmetrizer of T plus one boxes. So okay, and then then the subspace. Okay. Um, no, okay. This is the technical question. Like you know, I have like some expression of particular order or degree. Like, what are the basic building blocks from which I get it? You know. Anyway. Well, the simplest, the simplest way is you, you, you take the central young projectors all up to for all young tableau with more than d rows, okay. But then sure. of course you can decompose every of these subspaces again into into yes elements. Sure, sure, sure. Um, no, I, I was wondering about the basis, like you know, because probably you will have like a, a lot of redundancy if if you do what you suggest, right? Well. Uh, yeah, the redundancy is that you can factorize everything at the end to look exactly like this, to the completely autosymmetric uh, young mm -hmm. tableau of t plus one boxes. You can always factorize something out because the ring of these identities generated by the sort of smallest okay. element. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks. Okay, so any more, uh, more questions to Felix? Hi. Uh, so for, for the tensor stable, uh, Stuff. Did did you only give an example of tensor stable uh, operators that are tensor products of like the well thing? Um, if uh, you want an example for tensor stable maps, yes, yeah, so I guess my right, my real question would be like how this approach would tell you something about yeah tensor stable operators that are not uh, yeah just just acting on each subsystem. So here, um, with this uh, projector, um, projector onto the antisymmetric subspace of two systems, if you tensor them together, you get, uh, this is the most sort of the simplest example. Oh, sorry, here mm -hmm. this, this universal stating version. Yes. I sort of didn't completely write it out what happens, but you take this lambda of row above, take the same approach, and then you, you do this the same on every subsystem. And as Michal for before ah. said, this simply corresponds to tensoring together these projectors onto antisymmetric subspaces. And this actually has a nice application in quantum information theory. So there's at least a dozen or maybe more papers connected in some way to this to this uh, to this inequality. So I guess Nia's question was more whether like so. Uh, uh, how this approach gives you insight in this general problem, whether a given map is tensor stable. I, oh. was that your, like, this is how I understood. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wish, I wish I knew, but, <laughs> but it's a hard problem, no? Because um, non-trivial tensor stable maps uh, will give you uh, a proof for NPD bound entanglement, if I'm not mistaken. So this is a hard problem in general. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I sort of, I, I can't really tell you more because I don't think there's much more known. <laughs> okay, uh, last uh, uh, chance to ask something to Felix. So I only have not a question, but a remark. Hello, Felix. Hello. 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 Uh, are you aware of some recent papers on uh, 
tensor stable maps from the group of, let's say, Poland and Russia. So one name is Filipov, Sergei Filipov. He had some good papers about it. And then some of them with Hushchinsky, I think. Was it the okay? Was it in quantum? One of those? Well, things? possibly. I forgot now. We can check later on. No, but there were a few papers discussed uh, recently, I think, by Darius Hushchinsky, some well, some time ago. Okay, but anyway, thanks for the talk and thanks for coming to Poland. At least. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So. See you soon. Right. Okay. Yes. Well, generally. <laughs> So uh, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Carol, for like showing up. Yeah, okay. So I, I guess if there are no more questions to to Felix, that's uh, yeah. Let's thank him again for a very nice talk. Thank you.